Uh, hello and welcome to the final installment of uh, the AUD lecture series. Um, and thank you all for coming and sharing um, this evening's event. Um, I've been trying, or I should say, I spent the morning trying to figure out how to introduce Albert Narath, who on first inspection in Google has two clear sets of interests. First, uh, the responses of certain noble metals, such as gold, vanadium, alloys, as well as cesium and rubidium to nuclear magnetic resonance. Yes? <laughs> and second, the modernist obsession with so-called primitive architecture as a dehistoricizing force in the era of techno-scientific power. Of course, I already know that there are two Albert Naras. Um, they shared a home for some years in New Mexico. Um, one Albert Narath worked at the uh, Sandia, Sanidia, 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 Sandia, what is it called? The laboratory, sorry, in Albuquerque. Sandia, sorry, that's your father, right? Um, the other now works at the University of California at Santa Cruz in the Department of Art and Visual Culture, and yes, of course, they are father and son, right? Yeah. And, but I think there's a good reason to be confused. Uh, because Albert the Younger has been working on some of the science that was taking place near his father's lab in the 1960s, also funded by the federal government, but at Los Alamos. Um, and this proves that sometimes you needn't look much farther than your own backyard or your dad's uh, to find threads of a topic of major importance to your own field. Indeed, just outside his dad's laboratory window, I imagine, was an essential crossing point between the histories of architecture and science, a nexus that shows homologies in these disciplines modes of data gathering, uh, paradigms of knowledge production, and the absorption of state power. So beginning with his publication on R.M. Schindler's interest in the Tahoe's Pueblo, Albert the Younger, again, has begun to illuminate a terrain in the Southwest where architects, historians, and scientists reimagine the American state through an unholy alliance of primitivism and high-tech research in solar design and thermal performance. The book, I presume, Modernism in Mud, is forthcoming and is sure to resonate with much more than just an electromagnetic field. But this is not the end of it. Albert uh, the Younger also finished a dissertation in 2011 at Columbia um, on the topic of 15 years of art historical scholarship in Berlin at the close of the 19th century. Some, research, um, some results of that research were published in 2000. Team, um, and reveal yet another unholy alliance between art history and advertising, a relationship that Albert draws between the so-called Grossstadt and Barockstadt. So there's something about high and low, the technical and the primitive, the esoteric and the mundane, that ties his work together and makes it such a draw in our moment when those extremes so often coexist. So with that as the kind of introductory remark, please join me in welcoming Albert Nara, the younger. Uh, great, thanks a lot, Michael. Can you all hear me? Is it on? All that stuff. Okay. Um, I'm afraid to say that I'm actually the fourth. Oh. Isn't that just like totally embarrassing? And I won't even tell you who the first two were, because that's even more problematic than the one that I'm talking about tonight. Um, Somehow it's always about the father, I guess. Uh, but keep that out of your heads as I talk tonight. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I have that like unsavory task of being at the end of the poster and also being the person you don't recognize at the end of the poster and also at the end of the term. Uh, so there's a lot of ends uh, in, in the talk. Uh, so I really appreciate you being here uh, and your patience as I go through this. Um, is there a little light up here? Yeah. Uh, roll it. That's fine. It doesn't work. Um, so mud, mud, and more mud is what you're going to get uh, tonight, which is kind of maybe a good, light, fun, end of term thing. That's why the exclamation point mark is at the end of it, to get you all excited. In fact, this comes uh, as an inscription in a book I found in 2007 in Albuquerque, New Mexico by the awesomely named Bainbridge Bunting, uh, who was one of the pioneer architectural historians and architects, indeed, to talk about early architecture in New Mexico, 
which is something that I'll preoccupy myself with tonight. And this is his inscription to a friend uh, in 1977, the year I was born, uh, saying that inside this book is mud, mud, and more mud. So that's what you'll get tonight. So in the years immediately surrounding the oil crisis of 1973, a group of photographers trained their lenses on the energy landscapes of the American Southwest. Under the auspices of the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Documerica project, imagine the EPA well existed and then doing an art project today. Um, so under the auspices of the Documerica project, they roamed across sections of Arizona, Colorado, Utah, and New Mexico, recording the infrastructure of energy production and distribution that underlay the unwavering growth of western cities. Their images captured points of intensive contact between technology and terrain, and revealed landscapes in the midst of reorganization, where the coordinates of extractive capitalism and weapons research, together with an accompanying rhetoric of cultural resource management, were often superimposed on indigenous systems of land use. In the work of the photographer Lintha Scott Eiler, for example, scenes of recreation at Lake Powell appeared alongside less touristed sites, such as the Four Corners in Navajo generating stations, both constructed by the Bechtel Corporation on Navajo Dine land. Sites of industrialized digging at the Black Mesa and Navajo coal mines were juxtaposed with the hand digging of salvage archaeologists who employed carbon dating to trace the movements of Anasazi and Southern Paiute groups along the path of the Navajo Makulla transmission line. In the same years, the photographer Boyd Norton, a former reactor physicist for the Atomic Energy Commission, traveled through New Mexico surveying an alternative energy infrastructure that was emerging through the state's booming solar scene. Norton spent time at high-tech, high-energy installations like the Army's solar furnace at White Sands Missile Range, originally developed to test the resistance of different materials to nuclear explosions. But the bulk of his attention was directed at a group of comparably low energy experiments, like slacker experiments, as you can see here, um, uh, located at what some call the lunatic fringe of solar research. In Taos, Norton followed the construction of a beer can and earth plaster house by the architect Michael Reynolds. He met Steve and Holly Bear on the outskirts of Albuquerque for a tour of their iconic aluminum clad adobe zone house. In Santa Fe, he visited a converted adobe house designed by the architect Travis Price. These projects illustrated the basic principles of passive solar design, or what had been recently dubbed solar adobe. With their simple collectors, thick walls, and orientation to the sun, they achieved a stable interior climate largely through natural flows of energy, rather than fossil fuel intensive mechanical equipment. Directly before his arrival in New Mexico, Norton visited sites like the Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde, where he recorded walls that performed in much the same way as the new energy crisis vernacular that he discovered in the work of Reynolds, Bear, and Price. By the time Norton made his way through the Southwest, this was uh, a total widespread cliche. As the subject of energy and architecture was cast in terms of crisis, architects, owner builders, and engineers approached the adobe ensembles at places like Taos, uh, as a source of practical techniques and experimental wisdom that had itself been cultivated in conditions of resource scarcity. So in like countless instruction manuals, one after another that you can uh, find in the hippie section of any used bookstore, and in the popular publications that circulated within Back to the Land and soft tech networks, Adobe was upheld as a means of buildings with, building with one's own hands, of working with the earth rather than expending it as a commodity, and as a way of expressing continuity with indigenous forms of geospiritual knowledge. As Lucy Lepard has put it, the art critic, adobe is the rawest of raw materials. Pictures of adobe structures were also increasingly pinned up in architecture schools. In response to a questionnaire devised in 1977 by Charles Moore to assess the place of energy in American design curricula, Rainer Benham castigated what he called, quote, the faculty radical who fails any project that isn't built of three-foot-thick adobe and powered by chicken shit. <laughs> in other spaces, such as the Natural Forces Lab over at USC, <laughs> uh, 
where the technical subjects and data desire of environmental control science were recuperated as a basis for design, the thermal efficiency of adobe buildings was simulated with physical models and computer programs. Such was the ubiquity of this interest, and this is the studio of Ralph Knowles, um, which I write about in a, in a different place, and we can talk about after. Such was the ubiquity of this interest that one architect noted at conferences people joked about and then apologized for yet another view of some Native American Pueblo. And what follows, what I'm really <laughs> going to talk about tonight, uh, is one single kind of set of experiments uh, that happened at the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. So Michael's comment about my dad is true. Uh, and what other child grows up in New Mexico with souvenirs including uh, adobe bricks and also crystals from the waste isolation pilot plant, right? Those are my two childhood collections, which is bonkers. Um, in New Mexico, solar technologies were conducted with great fervor across a wide spectrum of individuals and institutions. Such was the valence of the movement that guidebooks were produced, and indeed miniature adobe bricks were prepared for tourists on the Solar Adobe Grand Tour. A little bit of New Mexico right there. Uh, my friend Ben uh, alerted me to this on eBay. I have a giant eBay fixation, as you'll see as I go through this. Significant research took place in countercultural communities, in professional design offices, in the workshop garages of independent inventors and tinkerers, and in highly instrumented government-funded laboratories. Non-sponsored, self-structured activities were not only conducted in parallel with more official forms of scientific research, but also in direct, albeit often uneasy, collaboration with them. It was out of these overlaps, with mechanical engineers, owner builders, and outlaw architects, of techno-science and homesteading, and of technologies of weaponry in what some in the movement called life support techniques, that the disciplinary contours of passive solar and solar adobe uh, took shape. The results appeared in equal frequency in formal scientific reports, design magazines like the AIA Journal that you see here, uh, and local publications, uh, the best ones, like Adobe News, a product of the Southwest. The solar scene was even part of a widely distributed slide set produced by the newly founded New Mexico Solar Energy Association that can still be found in the cobweb slide drawers of design school libraries. If you still have slides hanging around, you'll see this slide set in there. The glue that held this weird constellation together was not simply a set of construction methods or environmental control techniques, but a clearly defined discourse. This was signaled by putting the word solar in front of Adobe. I mean, solar is already an inherent a part of Adobe. Adobe is solar, but they built a theory around this. In many ways, we can trace this back to a landmark conference on passive solar heating and cooling that was held in 1976 at the University of New Mexico. Sponsored by the United States Energy and Development Administration, the event uh, drew together PhD engineers, solar freaks, and what conference organizers called a busload of California hippies, in order to funnel shared interests and anecdotal information into the contours of a legitimate field. At the end of two days filled with case studies, a loose definition of passive solar emerged through a set of frequently invoked oppositions. It was distributed rather than centralized. It was um, easily understood and built rather than specialized, responsive to place rather than undifferentiated, and tuned to natural energy flows rather than extractive. In a special session of the conference entitled Historical Perspective, these qualities were all traced back to the centuries-old practices of Pueblo builders. The historical continuity and adaptational mode of design attributed to Pueblo architecture was positioned against familiar narratives of technological progress, as well as the frustrating history of solar research in the United States, which was marked by a cycle of invention and reinvention subject to fluctuating energy prices and shifts in political power. We're undergoing one of those right now. The Pueblo's influence was conveyed on the cover of the conference proceedings. What a boring image to subject you to. Speaking of Instagrammable, um, I don't think this qualifies, probably. Um, the Pueblo's influence was conveyed on the cover of the conference proceedings. A large sum figure in the form of the Zia symbol, which had been appropriated from the Zia people in 1920 for the New Mexico flag, rises up behind the soft outline of a solar adobe house. The Zia Sun was simultaneously an energy source and a vague allusion to the field's self-constructed genealogy. 
At the bottom of the cover, the symbol's circular shape is picked up by the logo of the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, another of the event's main sponsors, which took the form of a stylized nuclear reaction diagram. In the mid-70s, Los Alamos constituted a major locus for passive solar research. A solar group was formed within the lab's Q division in 1974 as one of several new initiatives responding to the shifting terrain of government-funded energy research before and after the dissolution of the Atomic Energy Commission. The creation of the group, consisting uh, of around 25 scientists at its peak, signaled a small-scale migration of expertise away from the weapons projects that constituted the lab's techno-scientific DNA. This was embodied in the career path of this guy, Douglas Balcombe. After earning his PhD in nuclear engineering from MIT in 1961, Balcombe joined a group at Los Alamos called Project Rover. His research was dedicated to the development of a nuclear thermal rocket for use in future Mars missions. So based on tests conducted at Area 25, located on part of the Nevada test site called Jackass Flats, <laughs> Balcom was in charge of modeling the device's performance using the lab's sophisticated computers. Um, so here you see um, the remote control locomotive that transported the highly radioactive reactor between the assembly complexes and the test stand. And it was called uh, the Jackass Rail Line, the world's shortest and the world's slowest at the same time. <laughs> After funding for Project Rover was canceled in 1972, following NASA's decision to focus its efforts on the space shuttle, Balcom was then tasked with heading a new group at Los Alamos focused on creating spin-off technologies. So he thought about creating programs for superconducting power transmission, he thought about magnetic energy storage, and also the nuclear reactor gasification of coal. At the same time, he was becoming familiar with the grassroots activity of builders like Steve Mayer, who had gained national notoriety from his installation of dome-like structures and simple solar systems at the Drop City Commune um, in Colorado. Based in part on these encounters, Balcom started the solar group with the idea of bringing the computational modeling techniques developed for nuclear testing to bear on the complete, uh, comparatively non-volatile thermodynamics of an adobe wall. To use Balcom's words, this is where high-tech spacey things were brought face-to-face -face with the flapping plastic era of solar energy. As an article, published, an article published in The Atom, the lab's official newsletter, called Balcombe's group the hottest show in town, which is like lab the hottest show in town. Within the Atomic Age institutional culture of Los Alamos, however, the creation of a solar research initiative was received with considerable suspicion. The values underlying passive solar architecture in particular, affordability, open information exchange, attention to vernacular precedents, and an emphasis on buildings as objects of analysis, uh, contrasted sharply with Q Division's prevailing high-tech imperatives. High-ranking administrative figures saw the group's activities as hopelessly low technology, by which they meant that cost was considered a criterion for design. At one point, the director of the energy division reportedly called Malcolm to his office in order to ask, quote, couldn't you just do it with more lasers, unquote. For Malcolm, the ultimate potential of passive solar was a dispersed, highly individualized power network comprised of buildings fine-tuned to their surrounding microclimates. In contrast to competing big science solar initiatives such as Sandia Laboratory, so my dad was there then, Sandia Laboratory's power tower, Sounds like a church power tower or something, <laughs> um, whose massive receivers replicated the logic of centralized electricity sources such as nuclear plants. Balcom envisioned each building as a lived in solar collector that collapsed the collection, distribution, and consumption of energy into the walls of the building itself. And here you see that little sun figure again up there, the Zia symbol. With funding from the government, the solar group recorded the performance of 15 different buildings. Each one was instrumented with thermocouples for measuring temperature, a pyranometer for measuring solar radiation, and devices for measuring the velocity and direction of wind. The resulting data was processed through the lab's Cray-1 supercomputer, a piece of architecture in its own right that was originally intended for nuclear weapons calculations. 
so here you see the Cray 1, which had what they called a love seat all the way around it. Uh, and then that's its skins, which came in different colors. And on the left-hand side in the Cray Chips employee newsletter um, from 1989, they see that they're retiring it. But on the left side, there's a photograph of the Cray originally being delivered to Los Alamos, um, one of the first to be used. So using a custom script called pasole, which is like a New Mexico culinary dish, more lab humor. Um, so using a custom script called pasole, the team ran comparative simulations for different solar configurations. The idea was to create a quantitative basis for architectural design that took into consideration the mathematically beguiling, yet intuitively and experientially, experientially simple interaction of radiant energy and dry glow. As the former nuclear engineer Francis Wesling put it, another member of this group, when describing an old adobe structure in northern New Mexico, this is the way an engineer sees that house. Perhaps the most famous building in the program was Balcom's own home. After starting the solar group, he and his wife moved into the first residence completed at a speculative solar development called First Village, located on a 40-acre site in Santa Fe. Soon after its completion, the house became a required stop on energy crisis tours, the images of the building appeared in technical literature, mainstream architecture journals, and even in a full-page spread of Life magazine. The project was designed by this guy, uh, the architect William Lumpkins, a kind of guru figure in the New Mexico solar scene. Starting in the mid-1930s, Lumpkins maintained a productive practice, first in New Mexico, then in La Jolla, California, and then back in New Mexico again. This resulted in over 800 buildings, this guy designed. These included assembly line modular panel and block systems for the Custom Craft Institute in La Jolla. So here you see the panel projects. This is the uh, block system, and this is the grid paper you would get that you would cut out and organize floor plans onto. Um, he also designed shopping centers, hotels, churches, courthouses, naval research facil facilities, and even the San Ysidro border inspection station at the United States-Mexico border. Beginning in the 1940s, uh, based on his travels through and around New Mexico, he published a number of books that popularized the Spanish and Pueblo building traditions of northern New Mexico. They provided fuel for the explosion of Spanish Pueblo revival houses across Santa Fe. We can thank him, for example. Um, these are some of the buildings in the pattern book. Um, and this is from his archives, um, some of the many, many houses that were built according to his plans around Santa Fe. This is just what Santa Fe looks like everywhere. We can thank him for these buildings today, <laughs> where even McDonald's and IHOP, International House of Pancakes, or Casa de Pancakes, as it was called in Albuquerque, um, are, are located. Uh, but in general, the designs and the pattern books only unintentionally conveyed the energy efficiency that was an inherent part of Lumpkin's cultural sources. It was only in the updated post-oil crisis editions of the books where, um, where all of a sudden La Casa Adobe became Casa del Sol. Uh, it's just a kind of change of title. Um, where. Um, that he inserted obvious passive solar features into the romanticizing shapes of his templates. Um, so here you can see uh, a hot water uh, heater embedded in the kind of roof line. He'll put rock pits in, tron walls, things like that. At the Balcom House, Lumpkin certainly introduced regionally coded details such as projecting vigas, but otherwise distilled the design into a direct expression of its environmental control schemes. It was organized around an L-shaped plan with the north elevation sunken four and a half feet below grade. A two-story greenhouse occupied the south-facing central space. Incoming sun passed through double-pane glass and was then absorbed by 14-inch thick, thick adobe walls. <coughs> two large storage bins filled with rocks were located below the living room and dining room floors for supplemental active heating. There were also electric radiators installed as backup. The outer walls of the adobe structure were covered with fiberglass insulation, a vapor barrier, and an exterior coat of stucco. After Balco moved in, the Los Alamos team placed instruments at critical points along the walls and above the rock bins. While living in the house, Balcom was, in effect, both the designer and the subject of this experiment. 
As he and his wife undertook the daily ritual of opening and closing vents and raising and lowering shades, this is the essential labor of what was called thermal sailing, the effects of these activities on temperature fluctuation and thermal lag were continuously monitored. When numbers went array, debates ensued in the lab about whether it was the house or Balcom that was behaving improperly, or at least inefficiently. While this experiment depended on a previously constructed building, the group also participated in a more comprehensive initiative called the Sun Dwellings Program. Located on the property of Ghost Ranch, a dude ranch turned conference center near Abiquiu, New Mexico, that had been made famous in the work of Georgia O'Keeffe, like every Georgia O'Keeffe that you can see. With state funding, a team that included engineers, architects, solar energy advocates, and Adobe experts constructed four full-scale passive solar test houses designed by Lumpkin's office. They included a direct gain system, a trom wall system, a greenhouse system, and a control house with no added specific solar features apart from being constructed out of Adobe. During construction, the engineers embedded a dense network of thermocouples devices throughout each house's thick earthen walls. Balcom joked that with their thermocouple reinforced adobe, the buildings were the most high-tech, low-tech structures in the world. Uh, each building was monitored around the clock and through multiple heating seasons. The numerical readouts and graphs that Balcom's team produced from computer analyses of the test units provided the clearest picture to that point of the mechanisms lying behind the energy modulation of traditional earthen construction. At the same time that the sun dwellings functioned as, a, as sensitive instruments, they were also the subjects of a participatory workshop in traditional construction organized for a group of trainees drawn from nearby villages and Pueblo communities. This part of the project was sponsored by the New Mexico Manpower Administration. From the surrounding landscape, the group, har the group harvested timber for making vigas and sawdust roof, ins and sawdust roof insulation pumice for wall insulation, and earth for adobe bricks. Food storage areas, full harvest kitchens, and solar food dehydrators were installed to reflect traditional subsistence practices in the region. In its two parts, the Sun Dwellings program was a crystallization of the preoccupations of its coordinator, the architect, technologist, and solar pioneer, Peter Van Dresser. Here he is standing in front of his Santa Fe house, um, which recently sold for $300,000. It's like an early solar house. I was thinking I could Airbnb it, but um, it was bought before I could pounce on it. Beginning in 1972, uh, Van Dresser and Steve Baer initiated a series of conferences at Ghost Ranch called Life Support Techniques. The meetings led to the creation of the New Mexico Solar Energy Association and to a short-lived publishing venture called the Biotechnic Press. They put out a book by Van Dresser on the human ecology of the northern New Mexico uplands region, and also a reprint of Buckminster Fuller's book, 4D Time Lock, that would, become a, that would serve as a critical bridge between Fuller and the counterculture in New Mexico. Well before the onset of the oil crisis, Van Dresser had become a kind of cult figure at the far edges of architecture. He was, in his own words, a 1930s vintage dropout who had abandoned studies in architecture and engineering at Cornell. His body of work, notable more, for, and this is like a warning for any students who drop out. Um, you might become Peter Van Dresser, so careful. Uh, his body of work, notable more for its stubborn consistency than for its success, was penned at one end by the interconnected economic, political, and ecological challenges of the Great Depression, and at the other by the energy crises of the 1970s. So in the 1930s, he was involved in two seemingly antithetical groups. He was a regular contributor to the decentralist magazine Free America. The publication was spawned in part by the explosion of homesteading activity that occurred in the US through New Deal initiatives such as the Department of Interior's Subsistence Homesteads Division. He helped coordinate the publication's popular productive home architecture competition, whose jury included Richard Neutra and Anthony Raymond, and whose agenda was to engage elements such as food storage rooms, chicken coops, and manure piles as design problems. So like a whole section was literally manure pile as design problem. He also wrote weekly reports under the title Techniques of Decentralization. These detailed developments in what he called the invasion of the biological into the mechanical, 
a trend that he found codified in the establishment of the first academic program in biological engineering at MIT in 1938, and also in the writings of Lewis Mumford about biotechnics. But also in the 30s, he was a core member of the experiment committee of the American Rocket Society. It's not really, really? A pioneering group that created the first regeneratively cooled liquid fuel rocket. He also edited the society's newsletter called Astronautics. <laughs> I mean, he was being serious. But, uh, um, for that publication, as well as in science fiction pulps like Astounding Science Fiction, he argued that with the help of increasingly microsensitive instruments attached to sounding rockets, a new image of the Earth would emerge in which ions, electrons, radiation, and magnetic fields interacted across a wild ionospheric frontier. That's what he called it. This hidden world, and here you see the cross-section of it on the right-hand side. This hidden world of interrelationships, he thought, would be the subject of a new science that he called cosmicology, dedicated to the relationship between these energy forces and terrestrial phenomena such as crop growth and the harnessing of solar power. So 40 years later, Van Dresser's interest in decentralized homesteading on the one hand and precision high-performance engineering on the other would be combined in his collaboration with Balcombe and Lumpkins at the Sun Dwellings. The Sun Dwellings program gave quantitative weight to the techno-cultural narrative about solar adobe initiated at the 1976 conference I mentioned earlier. His solar group, however, was extremely short-lived. It was unceremoniously removed from the lab's institutional plan in 1979, before the election of Ronald Reagan instigated a more decisive hiatus in large-scale solar research. And I'm getting there uh, towards the end. The group's work made a decisive impact on the way in which Pueblo architecture would continue to be interpreted as a form of technology. In the summer months of 1981, for example, Pueblo architecture was the central subject of at least three major exhibitions. At that time, in the summer months of 1981, um, the National Mall in Washington, D.C. played host to the Adobe program an exhibition dedicated to the Pueblo and Hispanic adobe construction practices of New Mexico. It was anchored by a full-scale model house and a functioning orno, or beehive oven. Based on a year's worth of interviews and field visits in New Mexico, a group of adobe builders from the state, including contractors from Albuquerque and members of Taos Pueblo, erected the structures and offered daily workshops on the techniques of bread making and adobe brick making. The exhibit was part of the 15th Annual Festival of American Folklife, sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution and the National Park Service. Instead of being sponsored by the Smithsonian, however, it was funded by the United States Department of Energy. Since the DOE's formation in 1977, the agency organized installations at the festival each year that centered on the history of what they called folk technologies. These were considered to be pre-industrial, often low-tech, attuned to local climates and passed down through the mechanism of survival or revival. In a pamphlet produced to accompany the program, the historian Peter Nabokov, who teaches at UCLA, uh, pointed to Pueblo architecture as a prime example of a folk technology. His account of the deep cultural valence of adobe in Pueblo communities, where in many cases buildings were considered to be alive or formed through a process of raising, as in raising a crop or a child, uh, punctuated was punctuated throughout with the comparatively sober language of energy cost analysis. Nabokov included an idealized section drawing representing heat gain across a Pueblo building's south-facing surface. In contrast to the traditional use of the section by anthropologists to show the spatial relationship of kin groups and other social formations, its function here is to show the inputs and outputs of a machine. Pueblo architecture was, quote, the most basic of all passive solar heating systems, unquote. So in the same year, the popular exhibition Earth Architecture, curated by uh, Jean Dettier, opened at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. In a room set up to look like a contemporary architecture office, a selection of adobe projects introduced Balcombe and Lumpkins to an international audience and positioned the New Mexico solar scene within a larger global history of earthen architecture. So here you can see hiding the Balcombe House at the bottom of the exhibition catalog, now part of world history. Uh, the main installation featured a mixture of fake earthen fragments, 
posed against the unabashedly visible mechanical services of Renzo Piano and Richard Rogers' 1977 building, a project whose display of ducts and pipes had already become a poster child for an exposed power aesthetic in architecture. The visual dissonance between mud globs and the museum's metal armature fed into Dettier's campaign for alternatives to the fossil fuel dependence that he found in much modern architecture. And here I'm coming to the end, uh, I think. I think. Um, but throw something, you know. Both exhibitions attempted to challenge long-standing conventions and the architectural interpretation of Pueblo buildings. The first, to borrow a phrase from Rainer Bannon, involved, quote, that NASA kick of taking expensive hardware into hostile environments, unquote. So we all know that what architects ride through the desert is just as important as what they build in it. And here's Schindler on the left on a horse, Bannon on his bike, and Predock on his bike. Again and again, car ads have juxtaposed the Pueblo's earthen masses with the industrial materials and smooth vectors of mechanized transportation. Adobe's natural, naturalness affirmed the power of technology to penetrate through the performance of modern engineering and then to organize through the aesthetic frame of the window the West's remote peoples and landscapes. And I have like a really unhealthy collection of these. <laughs> so here's the Airstream. You know, it just goes on and on. And, and then think Easy Rider and all of that, too. Um, so that's one side of it. While this trope celebrated the reach of American technological culture, its twin, no less rooted in the rhetoric of settler colonialism, envisioned the Pueblo-built environment as perhaps the last refuge from it, a pocket utopia whose autochthonous harmony was made to bring order to, this disjo to the disjointed Anglo-European self. If you want to learn about this, you just have to read Vincent Scully. That's, I won't talk about him, but that's all you have to read. The desire of the Q Division was to imagine Adobe buildings not as technology's other, but rather as a counter-technology in and of itself, in which technology and nature could, be, uh, could not be envisioned as oppositional. So there are certainly many comparisons to be drawn with popular discourses about like appropriate technology, or soft technology, and just as in those discourses, I think it's important to ask, like, appropriate to who? Appropriate to who? So the last part of this talk, I promise, and you guys can go back to <coughs> doing what you do, um, is to talk about this just a tiny bit. And I'll skip over my NASA part, but, um, or maybe I won't. This is symptomatic of the positionality of solar adobe discourse, as well as a set of cultural adjacencies that were acutely felt in northern New Mexico. Across the region, the infrastructure of big science maintained um, a complex and often fraught relationship with the ecological systems and ritual topography sustained by the Pueblo groups whose lands it was built within. In 1971, for example, the Taos Plateau was used as the location of a terrestrial analog site for the Apollo 15 to 17 missions, the so-called big science missions. So here they are with fake backpacks and cameras. On the Pajarito Plateau, the buildings, roads, and wastelines of Los Alamos radically transformed the area's economy and ecology after the arrival of the Manhattan Project in 1943. At the same time that the project offered an influx of jobs, it also brought with it a dis uh, disruptive colonization of indigenous spaces that was reflected in part through an appropriative process of naming. For example, at Los Alamos, they had laboratories called Kivas, as you can see here. And they also had a thermonuclear device test that they called Tewa. Uh, they named all of their tests after Native American communities in the United States. The work of the Q Division unfolded in the midst of this fraught terrain, situated between the lab's techno-scientific legacy and the emergence of coordinated energy rights movements across, the southwestern, uh, across southwestern indigenous communities. Balcom's research therefore came at a critical juncture not just in the area, arena of national energy policy, but also in the ecological and architectural shaping of Pueblo lands. One of the Solar Group's key projects, and the last one I'll show tonight, was his group's participation in the design of a community center for Nambe Pueblo, as you can see here, located in close proximity to Los Alamos. Um, and I won't really read this part of it, but it's just a large addition to a museum a museum that was dedicated to artifacts uncovered from an archaeological excavation of a piece of land, sacred land, that was destroyed by a Bureau of Reclamation Dam project. 
Um, and Los Alamos collaborated with Nambe to create this passive solar community center. Um, this was at a moment, too, when Nambe was being completely torn apart by HUD housing policies. Um, and so in its official publications, HUD celebrated Pueblo architecture as a model for communal housing, even paternalistically calling Taos, quote, a classic example of low-income multifamily housing in its purest form, financed through, uh, what is it, financed through sweat equity and subsidized by Mother Nature, unquote. <laughs> In reality, however, HUD maintained a practice of constructing wood frame and concrete block single-family houses uh, according to a model of suburban planning that for many conflicted with Pueblo family structures. And I just wanted to end by saying that Nambe was also a site of critical resistance to these practices. Um, after the construction of the community center, members of the Pueblo waged a protracted campaign against HUD's practice of rejecting the use of adobe for housing. Their contention, bolstered by the analyses of the lab, was that earth architecture was not only culturally rooted, but also cost-effective. And that's like what HUD understood, that cost-effective part of the thing. Um, so then these houses became reference points uh, in, for example, a participatory workshop where Balcom himself uh, instructed Pueblo inhabitants on how to use Builder Guide, a software system he had developed at Los Alamos. And then the last thing. A year after the exhibition in D.C. and Paris, the Nambe houses were also featured in an exhibition on Adobe called The Center Space. Uh, this was a traveling show that went to several institutions throughout the year. And in a central section called The Changing Energy Picture, alongside panels featuring contemporary native architecture, a long forgotten model of Acoma Pueblo, completed in 1879 by the artist William Henry Jackson during his involvement with the Hayden Geological Surveys, was brought out from the archives and installed on a heliodome machine. A computer monitor next to it displayed graphic analyses of the 19th century model's simulated energy performance over the course of a day and through different seasons. While more recent models of Aqaba were available, including one by Ralph Knowles and his students at USC, the curator's choice to reclaim the Jackson model was particularly poignant, especially at the tricentennial of the 1680 Pueblo Revolt. In the 19th century, the model's appearance at expositions and museum displays expressed the government's intertwined objectives to record the indigenous cultures of the Southwest and profit from their natural resources. In this new context, however, the Jackson model stood out not only for an unbroken source of environmental wisdom that was still relevant to the modern world in the words of the catalog, but also as a symbol for data directed another way from the calculations of extractive capitalism and weapons research to an incipient politics of energy sovereignty. That's it. Thanks, guys. Questions? Oh, sure, yeah. If anybody else like, dares to stick around. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. we have people here in the audience who are from Albuquerque, so. Um, oh, we do? <laughs> Yeah, we just constantly on cake That's like a dinner story. Yeah. That was Albuquerque. They actually changed the name because International House of Pan Pancakes had a health code violation. And they reopened literally the next day as Casa de Pancakes. <laughs> Anybody want to start it off? Um, I have a question. Um, <laughs> you literally have to. <laughs> um, it's more about, um, I mean, maybe it's also a little bit of trying to create a little bit of a, a bridge. Um, it's about representation. Um, and uh, there, maybe in the earlier part of the of the presentation you showed the high-tech, low-tech Adobe with the two um, with the, the two probes inside of a piece of clay um, and the relationship between, let's say, a kind of rigid or closely ruled surface uh, of the technological object which sits inside of this freehand drawing of the, of the Adobe Thing that's around it, um, and my question—well, it's kind of a, it's a probe, 
actually to you to how one affect the other. Just to say, do you see any change in the techno-scientific modes of representation in relation to the seemingly un unformed, formless object of clay? And do you see then, in return, any kind of re um, a deep, deeper interest in the representation of, of Adobe as, as something that can be brought under some kind of rigorous sort of, sort of um, standardized form of, of production? So is there a relationship between the immediately modern, obviously modern object buried within the so called mm -hmm. Yeah, good one. Uh, I, maybe I'll approach it in a couple of ways. And I also want to say that my friend Ben's in the audience, and he's really an Adobe expert. Um, and so I'm going to shy away from proclaiming too many things about Adobe and its production in terms of a technical kind of conversation uh, for fear of losing my friend Ben. But, um, but I will say that, uh, um, I mean, part of the problem with this whole discourse it was in neither place, which is to say that in the institutional culture of Los Alamos, there was great difficulty with even claiming that this kind of object, which I don't think was ever thought of as a primitive object, because Adobe, it's alive and well, and people are making it. And it's, so that primitivizing discourse is there in other publications. But in that lab, I don't think they thought of it at all as a kind of primitive thing that they were subjecting technology to. Um, but the graphs, if you read these kind of like conference proceedings, a lot of them are hand-drawn. and kind of like, So even like the technical analyses although going through these computers and huge data sets, um, were also translated into a kind of language that could be understood by an owner builder. Uh, the product of it, in other words, were not PhD engineers all the time, uh, but people who uh, were really interested in using a long heritage of construction uh, but under the kind of guise of an energy efficient building. Um, so there was a funny relationship, and I think um, precisely at the level of representation, the tensions are there. Um, and the other way I would answer it is that it's at the same time that um, this kind of environmental control stuff begins to really infect like a virus architecture school curricula in the 1960s and 70s. Murray Milne uh, is the person who's at UCLA at the same time that Ralph Knowles, or a little earlier than Ralph Knowles, was at USC. Oregon played a role. Um, this is all happening, um, the kind of scientification um, of design in a certain sense, um, building a lot on those MIT experiments of the 50s and so on and stuff. In the UK. Um, but for Knowles, I mean, they would literally build models from aerial photographs of Pueblo communities, put them on a heliodon apparatus, put the camera in the position of the sun, and photograph them at different points in the day in order to make these kind of subsequent graphs, which were at every move displacing the author um, from the act of looking. So for Scully, for example, what many find very odious about his description of the Pueblos is it's Scully like the Marlboro Man marching in there and looking. And his illustrations are supposed to be the evidence of his looking, like that he's there, Scully, pronouncing. Uh, but for Knowles, the thing was to distance. Uh, and then the whole representational strategy um, goes into a larger history of scientific uh, kind of illustration. Um, the, Sources that Knowles uses are all archaeological sources from the 1920s, which was when archaeology went through its own yearning stage to be a science, uh, and was completely obsessed with things like tree ring data. Uh, and the tree ring data was important because the tree recorded its own rings so that the scientists wouldn't mess up looking at it. Uh, it was like nature's diary or something like that. And so um, I think part of this uh, is trying to scientify um, what had been a very practical kind of thing. This whole weird thing of, you know intuitively that the building works, but how do you come up with a representational strategy uh, to express uh, more exactly? And it turns out that Adobe is like super hard to calculate in terms of these thermal um, things. At least this was like in the Adobe News. There's this guy, Francis Wesley, who's drawing his graphs, and everybody was pissed off at him because he wasn't actually modeling real Adobe. He was simulating what he thought it would be, and then other people. So it's a really interesting thing that I try to pull apart in the larger, but representation is key. And, and, uh, 
I talked so long because I wanted you guys to like then think while I was talking about questions. <laughs> do, you, do you need this? Yeah. Sure. Just super briefly. What a great moment to be here. Um, when when yeah. McDonald's is built in Santa Fe, yeah. are those those are not Adobe walls though, right? That's that's like a wooden framed or steel framed. Totally. Door. So it's just the facade. Nothing about the performance of Adobe lasted, but the sort of style. Yeah, it's like filled with chicken nugget insulation. <laughs> but no, no, I, your question is a great one. And it goes to the really very heart of this thing, because Lumpkins, this architect, the early work, intuitively he knew that those styles really performed well, but it wasn't the kind of discourse that emerged in the 70s where it became calculated and part of this passive solar thing. And so a lot of those buildings that were built in Santa Fe function really well. Like Rainer Bannum comments about this too, that if you drive around Santa Fe, they perform awesomely, some of these actual Adobe buildings, but they do it accidentally, because they were trying to copy a style. And in doing that, they carried over a kind of technical language and set of skills. But the McDonald's, no, not at all. I mean, I think that that is totally air conditioned. And there's no like passive solar burger joint, you know, it, at least in McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, great question. Though. At least I, I don't know, I don't think so. I've never seen the section diagram. <laughs> but I have seen one of the big Mac. But it's a rule of insanity, right? Everything has yeah, to be yeah. like that. So that's the other thing, is that it's cultural boosterism. Um, there's a great book called The Myth of Santa Fe, in which a historian charts an entire history of how Santa Fe creates itself as a kind of image of these traditions and of, you know, all of that stuff. And that's why you go around today and there are laws, there are guidelines written into everything um, that if you're going to build, you've got to build brown. You know what I mean? You've got to do the stucco or the whatever. Yeah. Right. Burning or are we done? Yeah, we're done. <laughs> hey, students, congratulations on the end of the year. You're almost there. I'm really excited to see all your stuff on Instagram and on the web. And everything. Um, so, you know, email me, find my Instagram and send me your projects. I really want to see what you're about to do. Okay, bye.